Hello and welcome to Backwards Compatible, a show that critiques games of the past in long form. This video is the first in a many part series where I will examine the Uncharted franchise of games created by developer Naughty Dog. I will begin with Uncharted Drake's Fortune, and I must tell you I will be spoiling the entire game from here on out. You have been warned. Without further ado, let's begin. Uncharted Drake's Fortune released in November of 2007 exclusively for the PlayStation 3. It's a radical departure from anything Naughty Dog had done prior with their Jack and Daxter and Crash Bandicoot series of platforming games. To examine this game, I will talk through the story from beginning to end, stopping to discuss issues as they arise. We start off in a small barge in the middle of nowhere, dredging up an object which you are told is the coffin of legendary explorer Sir Francis Drake. We are introduced to our main protagonist, Nathan Drake, and other main character, Elena Fisher. We don't know much about them at this point, but we can determine a few things right away. The dialogue pins our two characters as neither being wholly serious. The conversation they begin with is lighthearted and full of banter. Drake seems to be the explorer in charge, and Elena the reporter trying to get the story. The salvage operation is clearly understaffed and possibly illicit. Immediately we are presented with a very light tone. This isn't a well-funded corporate salvage operation, and these two aren't professionals, which will be very important for framing the events of the game. More on that later. The coffin is empty except for a journal of Sir Francis, and shortly after pirates attack and we begin the shooting tutorial of the game. Do you know how to use one of these? Uh, yeah, it's like a camera. You just you point and shoot, right? Good girl. I want to hit pause here for an important remark. What you are seeing is the PlayStation 4 remaster of Uncharted 1, on easy no less. This is for capture purposes only. I originally played the game on hard on PlayStation 3 years ago and replayed on PS3 for this review. There are only minor changes between the versions, but I thought to mention this now, it is simply easier for me to capture the PlayStation 4 footage. So Drake enters a fight with the pirates. From his cavalier attitude, we can see that this might be a common occurrence for him. While fending them off, there are a few that you can shoot, but your gun will have no effect on them until they jump off their invading boat and onto yours. And later on, a man with a rocket launcher starts shooting the boat, but cannot be killed. This is because Naughty Dog bends the rules to set up certain moments. These guys cannot be killed until they jump onto your boat, so the game can teach you its limited hand-to-hand -hand combat system. The guy with the rocket launcher is invincible, so Nathan can be saved by Sullivan. This is just the beginning, but I wanted to state now that I'll be mentioning these moments when they happen, because I'll be bringing up a larger point at the end of the video. Go. We are introduced to Victor Sullivan as a clearly older treasure hunting partner to Nate. The pair use the journal to discover a clue to the infamous El Dorado City of Gold and ditch Elena to go off and find it. Should have seen that one coming. Nathan Drake and Sullivan stumble upon some kind of ruins less than a minute after gaining control of Nate. Despite the name Uncharted, there is almost no exploration or discovery in this game. Our characters are just instantly there. You enter the ruins and Sully reveals that he is in debt. Again, it's handled with a brazen attitude as if this is a regular occurrence. Moving forward, you are presented with a gap and a very obvious exploding barrel that will make a very convenient bridge. I think this is supposed to teach you that you can shoot these barrels and they will explode, but its placement simply makes you ask, why is this here? They both proceed forward to open a door, which, watching this now, doesn't logically make sense because the counterweight should be at the top, of the chain not the bottom, but whatever. The next puzzle is also kind of strange. Sully lights a brazier that you can conveniently use to burn the wooden rubble blocking your way, but the two events are completely unrelated. After a couple more light puzzles, you find where El Dorado used to be, that it is a statue and not a city, and has been carted off somewhere. A gold statue? A huge gold statue. And look here, these people, they're worshipping the damn thing. At least, I think they're people. You begin to track where the statue might have been, only to find the wreck of a German U-boat somehow hoisted upon the rocks of the island. This is where Drake inexplicably gives his journal to Sully, presumably so it doesn't get wet, only he went swimming with it minutes earlier. It's a clear setup for the book deflects bullet gag, and it is really kind of dumb. Anyway, 
Drake finds his next clue and returns to Sully, only to be confronted by the person Sully owes to, Gabriel Roman and his pet Navarro. Hey, hey! Friends of yours, Sully? I'm Gabriel Roman. Yeah, I know who you are, asshole. I think it comes off as extremely forced that they managed to track you given no signs of such tracking before, but hey, maybe they are that good. After some banter, Sully is shot for little to no reason and the U-boat explodes allowing Drake to escape. Elena finds him, somehow, again due to the powers of extreme convenience, and you have to travel back through the ruins again, this time fighting your way through. Somehow Elena missed the 30 or so heavily armed soldiers on her way in. Drake and Elena escape the island and they decide to continue pursuit of the treasure, taking them to a new tropical island. Their plane is shot down by anti-air guns, because I guess that was a priority when setting up camp on the island, and Drake and Elena are separated once more. There is a little calm before Drake begins one of the longest series of combat encounters in the game, with only a couple brief climbing sections to break it up. So now is a good time to talk about combat. This is a third person shooter, compared to when it came out to Gears of War which released the year prior. Both have cover mechanics and waist high walls abound, both have similar grenade lobbing controls, both have swarms of enemy that seemingly come from anywhere they damn well please. But unlike Gears of War, the minute to minute of combat isn't very enthralling. The gunplay in this game works well enough, and can be satisfying to a degree. It's not anything special, but it works. However, many other elements of combat do not. For starters, let's talk about how guns work. You can have a pistol, a rifle of some kind, and grenades. Not a lot of options already, but here's the kicker. You can never have enough ammo to use any weapon for long. Pick up an AK-47, it will have about 30 bullets. And because enemies can be such bullet sponges and spraying from behind cover is encouraged, you'll go through that one clip rather quickly. Need ammo? Pick up another and it will have 13 or so bullets. That's because the game is, well, gaming the player. If Nate picks up a shotgun after holding an AK, it will have 8 or so bullets. But if he is already holding a shotgun, it will be about 2 or 3. See what I'm getting at? The game will change the amount of ammo in a weapon drop based upon if you are already carrying that weapon or changing your weapon out, making it so that switching weapons is rewarded but using the same one and trying to stock up ammo is severely penalized. You can game this system, however. Pick up an old pistol before picking up a shiny new Desert Eagle and it will be a full magazine. But regardless, this system is utterly nonsensical and infuriating once discovered. Constantly switching weapons promotes frantically scouring the environment for new dropped weapons, which leads you open to enemy fire, which will get you killed. I do not mind having to change tactics mid-battle, but it is so much and not exciting when it occurs, just frustrating. Made even worse by the fact that there isn't much to unarmed combat. Another problem with combat is that enemies are everywhere. I don't mean that there are just a lot of them, no, they are everywhere. Enemies will spawn from locations that make little to no sense, and areas that one might expect to be devoid of enemies, such as locked catacombs, are still crawling with them. There is usually no rhyme or reason to it. I don't mind the developer forcing the player to have to constantly think about their environment and cover, but there are multiple moments in this game where it feels like you are infiltrating a military base rather than an abandoned, uncharted island. What are these guys doing at the edge of this waterfall? Why did they drive their truck here to this dead end and immediately start shooting you as if there was any way they could possibly see you? Were they here to deliver the exploding barrel you ordered? Well, thanks. What is this grenade crate doing here? Who put it here? When Drake finds the remains of his crashed plane, I'd expect there to be a few goons, but there are 25 in this combat arena alone, and they come in from two different places. To be clear, I'm not currently addressing the whole ludo-narrative dissonance debate that's constantly brought up about the Uncharted games, but rather I'm simply posing that not a lot of thought was put into how these combat arenas are created. Worse yet, the final five or so goons blow up a door to get to you and come from seemingly nowhere. There's a trap down this path that they would have had to either trigger or disable, and then there's a one-way jump that would have been really impressive for them to do, and some climbing as well. I'm not saying it's impossible or anything, just that it pushes beyond believability. And before you think I'm nitpicking here, no, this is many of the combat arenas. Fast forwarding for a second to where you do a puzzle to unlock an underground area only to find it 
already inhabited by enemies, and there are even work lights. I can tell you that there is no way into this room other than this heavy door which requires a crank that's on the side that would be inaccessible for them. But somehow, there are soldiers down here and they also bother with work lights too. It's not that it's impossible. But again, the world is breaking to service the combat and the need this game has for combat encounters to be very frequent. So back on track, Drake begins to scale a large fortress wall, a welcome change from the dense jungle that preceded it. You won't be surprised to find this fort crawling with enemies, and it makes a little more sense here. After a lot of combat, Francis Drake's map leads to a tower of no importance. It has keys to open a door that Drake couldn't possibly have known would still be there. This leads to a courtyard that has more enemies and a turret gun. I just don't know who they were expecting that they brought this turret up here, but I guess it was in the budget along with the anti-air guns. Eventually, you see Elena openly filming, completely oblivious to all the shooting around her. You save her only to be knocked unconscious and thrown in jail. In jail, you meet the game's third antagonist, Eddie Raja, my favorite of the bunch. He's a little more unhinged and unprofessional than the other villains, and his history with Drake makes him a little more interesting. And his golden gun is a very nice touch. I wish he became the main villain or that he and Navarre's roles were seemingly combined because having three separate antagonists is just too much. Is that it? Is that my deal? Die now, or help you, and die later. That's oh, a tough call, but you know what? I'll take die now. Die now! Listen to me, maggot. I was promised treasure on this goddamn rock. And now, my men are dying. They can't even go outside to take a piss without an armed guard. And I have nothing to show for it! Next begins an on-rail vehicle section which has Drake on a turret and Elena driving through the jungle while being chased. Gameplay-wise, this is a set-piece moment that can change up the action. Narrative-wise, I hate it. You destroy approximately 37 vehicles during this encounter, which I don't believe for a second actually made it in this island. It's a tropical island and it would be seemingly very difficult for most of these things to navigate to the terrain. Later on after the chase, Elena jumps a gap and she and Nate are seemingly free but almost slide off of a cliff. During this time, Eddie not only catches up to you but has time to get out of his vehicle, walk pretty far up to Drake without either he or Elena noticing. Anyway, Drake puts the car into reverse and falls off the cliff, killing them both. The end. No, of course, the adventure continues and Nate and Elena find themselves in the Drowned City, probably one of the game's most interesting areas. Or it would be, if it weren't an excuse for another long series of combat encounters. Seriously, this one is the worst. Just when you think that there would be a break from the combat in an area no soldier should be in because... Why would they? Nope. More enemies. It's a real shame too because I think the Drowned City makes for a great backdrop for a quiet moment with Nate and Elena as they walk through, which kind of happens just in a cutscene. Drake proclaims that he just wants to call it quits and Elena is actually the one pressuring him into continuing to look for the treasure. Right there. That's our ticket out of here. Come on. Our ticket out of here? Are you giving up? Maybe you hadn't noticed, but we're kind of outnumbered. We're doing fine so far. Oh, Lord. Elena, I don't need your bullet-riddled corpse on my conscience. Let's go. Oh, please. You quit if you want to, but don't use me as an excuse. It's interesting because thus far, Nathan Drake has been mostly unfazed, so it's nice to see Drake have more of a human moment. I think the idea exists that maybe in Drake's adventures, the off-screen ones, have never gotten quite so deadly and daring before, and perhaps having lost Sully and being constantly under fire has rattled him, and he no longer has his buddy or father figure to console him. Maybe. I'm not so sure. I don't think it comes off as very earned, but I think it's nice, at least in the grand scheme of the series, to have a moment where Drake wasn't so addicted to the end goal of treasure hunting. Elena is a bit stranger. She went from barely having shot a gun to driving a turret truck through a dense forest. There's something to be said that she might be some kind of adrenaline junkie. After all, it's not like she's recording a lot of this stuff. But again, I think this moment matters more in the grander scheme of the series than it does in this one game, so I'm sure we'll revisit this in a later video. 
Okay, now is the dreaded jet ski section. I can tell you that this is my most hated section of the game. For starters, it doesn't control well. Piloting the jet ski isn't fun, and controlling Elena's aiming is awkward at best. There are enemies plopped randomly around these ruins as if they were expecting you to come this way and thought sabotaging the jet ski would be too easy. There are exploding barrels that, well, I cannot fathom a story excuse for their existence or why Elena now has a rocket gun with infinite ammo. As a whole, I don't mind rules being fudged to create set piece or action movie sequences in the Uncharted games, but I think there is going too far and this one isn't even fun to play. You can be one shot on the barrels and you have to restart from the beginning, no checkpoints that I encountered. There's some more combat, another jet ski section, more combat. If I'm beginning to sound repetitive, it's because it is. The combat sections are the same kind of encounters but with different arenas, and mostly the same weapons too. There is little in the way of change that makes one encounter unique to the next, and admittedly it all begins to blend together. Nate zip lines down an out of place steel cable, meets up with Elena, and enters a cutscene that tells Nate and Elena they are on the right track. They do a little flirting. That somebody special? What? Oh. Uh, yeah. I guess you could say that. Huh. I had you pegged as more of a woman in every port kind of guy. <laughs> Don't I wish. No, this was, uh, this was Francis Drake's ring. I, you know, kind of inherited it. Sick Parvis Magna? Greatness from small beginnings. It was his motto. But more importantly, Drake continues to be set on leaving, and Elena wants to stay. More combat, and then we get to a section where Drake is on the outside of the customs house, and it's here I want to address two Naughty Dog tropes. The breakaway scenery and the death planes. Climbing sections are obviously a big part of the Uncharted games, but they are often criticized for being too simple and straightforward. There is usually only one path to follow, and although the path seemed a little more organic in this game than in later ones, probably because Naughty Dog hasn't started using the color yellow yet to lead the player, there isn't much to climbing. However, it does serve a couple functions. Breaking up the combat, which aids pacing, and providing a sense of exploration. For those reasons, I don't mind climbing in the Uncharted series, though I do wish there was a little more agency to it. What I do mind is when every little piece of scenery will break when you touch it, as if it hadn't been standing already for hundreds of years. It really bothers me because it comes off as forced. Look at the way this balcony breaks. It doesn't even make sense. Also, can we talk about how Drake climbs with a gun in one hand? I have no real life experience, but that looks like it's difficult. The other trope I don't enjoy that often comes up during climbing sections are the ridiculous death planes. For those who don't know, a death plane is an area or elevation that will insta-kill Drake if he touches it. In many cases, this can be if he misses his jump and falls to his death. But in other cases, they are placed just off of the intended path and again, make little to no sense. Here you hit a death plane after falling 5 or so feet. The jumping in this game is fairly automatic, so if this does happen, you are doing something the game doesn't want you to do, which can happen a lot. It's fine as a way to reset the player so they don't have to climb back to where they were, but it can be annoying to see Nate constantly ragdoll when trying something that looks like it should work, but doesn't. Back to the story, more combat through the customs house where Drake fights his way to a boat that may be able to be used for an escape. Elena inexplicably catches up to him. Remember that collapsed balcony? Somehow not a problem for her. Drake is about to take the boat when Elena shows him that somehow Sully is still alive and with the enemy, for reasons we are yet unsure of. They decide to find him and walk across a rickety bridge where Nate literally dents a board and Elena doesn't pay attention at all and steps on the broken board. She almost falls and is forced to drop her camera, and her alleged reason for pushing forward kind of disappears. It's not addressed though, ever, unfortunately, but at least it lends more credibility to the fact that she is getting addicted to the idea of adventure. Another jet ski sequence. This time around you have to fight the controls even more traveling upriver. There are more exploding barrels, but at least there is a source for them this time around, even if it still makes no sense. If they are throwing them in the river to stop you, why? Wouldn't it be more effective to dam the river or something? I don't know. There are more barrels after this that do not have a source, so it's as nonsensical as ever. After departing the jet ski for thankfully the last time, Elena and Drake come upon a recently made trap as evidenced by the pieces of their plane used in its construction. 
This is dumb. It's supposed to tint at the fact that something else is going on within the island, but knowing the twist, we know that this kind of elaborate trap is beyond the monsters seen later. But whatever, Elena says it best. Wait, that doesn't make any sense though. Drake fights his way to the monastery where Sully might be and the two confront him. We find out that the journal deflected a bullet and Sully has been just going along with the bad guys and even misdirecting them. He is still set on getting the treasure and gets Nate excited about it too so they decide to press onward to see if they can get ahead of Roman and Navarro. Let's address the ridiculousness of the bullet book. I don't mind it. I've been fairly harsh on the game so far, but I want to make it clear that while some things are poorly thought out, especially combat encounters and set pieces, I think the tone of the game is very well done. It's meant to be a lighthearted romp. Our protagonist is meant to be constantly sarcastic and cracking jokes because it's meant to be seen as a fun action flick. That's not to say the characters don't have depth or aren't believable. I still think they are well developed, but the mechanics of the game and the over-the-top plot points like a book saving someone's life are designed to frame the story so the player can feel like a superstar action-adventure hero, cracking jokes and not taking moments of peril seriously. I think the game accomplishes this well. I only wish the gameplay and tone were a little more synergized. Now we enter a sequence of the game that I, and many other players, really dislike. When you reunite with Sully, he informs you that the answer must be in this room, and it is, kind of. After a short puzzle, Drake opens a secret path to an underground chamber. This must be it, right? Nope. It's merely a tunnel to the monastery, and nothing more. There isn't even an explanation for why it exists other than it being a red herring. On top of that, there are enemies here, and this is the room I mentioned earlier. It's closed from this side, and again, it serves no purpose, so why are they down here? In the monastery, ringing two bells opens another secret path, except it's not. More enemies, more work lights, and no explanation. Again, it leads to a door that's closed by a mechanism on this end. Before that, very briefly, we have a cutscene with our three antagonists. It's pretty entertaining. Other than that, I really don't have much commentary. I suppose it's nice to see this side of the villains when they are not simply boasting in front of the protagonists. Weirdly enough, these are probably the most realistic antagonists in the series. After another combat encounter, Drake ends up back at the monastery where he finds a secret room, which again, serves no purpose. It's designed to let someone see the heart and key symbol on one of the buildings, but it's clearly visible from the ground as well. Drake says he has to do this quietly, but since this game lacks stealth mechanics, that's impossible. Trying to go through this section sneakily will only get you killed. Somehow Elena and Sully teleport in front of you. Another symbol puzzle, and the dumbest one I might add. Navarro was in this very room, presumably for a while, and didn't even try these things? And he had the book with the answers. Eh, anyway, a trap closes and Elena and Drake are separated from Sully once again. Next begins my favorite room in the whole game. It's a simple puzzle where Drake has to follow the path of the numbers 2, 5, and 7. What I like is that it's solving a puzzle while climbing. It's dreadfully easy, I mean there's almost no puzzle to it, but I like that it's not as straightforward as most of the climbing, while also not being a rotate the symbol or statue puzzle. Honestly, I wish something like this room would have been developed further. There is a correct path and you have to solve a puzzle to know which way to climb, something more complicated than the numbers but not too complicated. Going the wrong way is a death trap of some kind and it could be interesting. Anyway, I love the idea of solving a puzzle while moving through the environment instead of just the usual stationary ones. If you think this room is finally it and you are finally ahead of the bad guys, well, you're not. Eddie Raja finds this room as well, presumably from an alternate entrance made to bypass that special 257 puzzle. Whatever. Again, this could have been a really cool area to fight in if there were death traps everywhere and Drake could lure enemies into them. As it stands, it's a standard fight made a little better by how vertical the room is. Drake discovers the body of Sir Francis Drake and finds out that he never found the treasure. It's a nice moment in introspection that Drake has. Francis seemingly gave everything to find El Dorado and has still failed, losing his life in the process. Now Drake just wants to get off the island, but this creates an issue. He wanted to earlier as well, but, and he had the chance to after meeting up with Sully. Maybe he is conflicted, and being conflicted is okay, but it's presented in such a binary way. Drake's motivation keeps switching. Later on it becomes about saving Elena and stopping the monster plague, but I don't like how it switches back and forth. Drake becomes much more adamant about his end goals in the future that I don't think this binary nature makes much sense. 
One could argue he really does want the treasure, and saving Osoli and Elena just gives him more motivation, but this scene and dialogue betrays that. He even gives up his precious ring. I've done my best to look at this game in a vacuum from the sequels, as I think it's the fairest thing to do, but as an origin story for Drake, I think this is one area where the character's arc doesn't quite add up. I like it in terms of this story, how non-confident he is and how Elena and Sully are actually the ones pushing him to continuing forth, but it doesn't make sense in the long run. Moving on, Drake runs into Eddie again and the area becomes a combat arena for a fight against the monsters, also known as the Descendants. What the monsters are yet, we don't know, but let's examine what we do know. Supernatural twists are a staple of this type of story. An adventure, hidden temples, a tomb, ancient traps, all leading to something supernatural at the very end. Indiana Jones had it, Tomb Raider had it, and now Uncharted has it. And in general, I like it. It's a nice little reward for the third act of a story, and it adds mystery and a payoff at the end. After all, players aren't really likely to care a whole lot about treasure and gold. It's actually kind of boring. But supernatural twists that put you against monsters all of a sudden? Now that's interesting. I won't say it's handled in the best way, they end up simply being shotgun fodder, but it's still different and fun, and this fight is made all the better by the banter with Eddie. Jake, if we don't make it out of here, I just want you to know, I hate your guts. Yeah, likewise, pal. Now let's do this. Eddie is killed, and Elena and Drake escape to find themselves in a submarine base that was built into the island. It's kind of interesting, at least it's a change from the standard jungle fare, but again it doesn't quite add up. I suppose the idea is that the Nazis found out about the treasure, discovered that it could be used as a weapon, and then did some experiments with it before the monster horde eventually overcame them. But it feels to me like Naughty Dog wanted to shoehorn Nazis in the game for extra intrigue points. Nate has to turn the power back on to use the elevator because apparently there are no stairs or ladders to the surface, so Nate fights his way to the generator room through the monsters. Once he turns the power back on, it starts a projector, showing a video explaining that El Dorado is protected by a curse that eventually wiped out the Spaniards and the Nazis, and that Francis Drake was trying to destroy it. Shortly after this, Elena is captured and Drake has his motivation for pushing forward. Nate fights his way to the monastery again to open the fourth secret path there. This one actually leads to El Dorado. Nate and Sully stupidly walk in without a care in the world and promptly are held at gunpoint. We get our payoff. Finally, El Dorado, which is revealed to be a coffin containing a cursed corpse. Roman is tricked by Navarro into opening it and becomes zombified himself. I guess Navarro was really the brains? It's kind of unclear. I don't think either he or Roman were developed enough. The most one could say is that Roman is out of his element chasing some treasure that he has no business to as he is too white collar, and Navarro actually knows what's going on and is using Roman. But those are guesses. We don't know what Roman does other than he speaks eloquently and how Navarro knows about the curse is anyone's guess, but he understands well enough to know that opening the coffin will only affect Roman and not reach him about 10 feet away. Also, what was the plan if Roman didn't close it himself? The following sequence is one I really like. Drake has to fight his way through monsters and soldiers to grab a hold of the statue. My first thought here was to jump straight over and swim, but nope, you can't do that and it will cost you one death to find out why. Nate eventually jumps onto El Dorado that has flown out and you are carried out to a boat at sea. Really quick before that, you see this hole El Dorado is being carried out of? Yeah, you can go up to this hole earlier in the game, but it's just a black pit. And despite the work light surrounding it, we still can't see El Dorado, even though it should be right there. I don't want to dwell on plot holes, in this case a plot hole hole, but there are a lot of them, and it would be nice if some of the more obvious ones weren't overlooked. This one could have easily been avoided by having something covering this hole that the bad guys would have had to blow up to get to El Dorado. The part on the boat is the final sequence of the game. The helicopter carrying El Dorado crashes, and you are pitted against Navarro. I hate this part with a passion. How it works is that there are a couple goons you have to kill while Navarro fires at you with a shotgun. Except Navarro can't be killed or wounded. He's invincible. You just have to kill his goons until he runs off into the next section. This is made more offensive by two things. One, his weapon can insta-kill you, even on easy. And two, if you try to get close to him, he will auto-target onto you and kill you, meaning that you have very little leeway in how you handle this encounter. 
and one-shot kills are a cheap way of controlling you into doing only what Naughty Dog wants. Also, if you run out of ammo during this part, you have to die. You have no other option. This sets up a battle on the helipad where you have to move from cover to cover, once again in one way and no other way, or you die instantly. He will even double shot you in an impossible way if you try to move while he is shooting. Navarro's gun jams or something, the laser sight coincidentally goes out at the same time, and you can melee him. I don't know what the plan was before that. Nathan beats him to the ground, and instead of going for the shotgun, Nate goes for Elena, pushes the helicopter off the ledge, and gruesomely goes Navarro. Everyone's happy. Sully even stole some treasure, and we get hints of a Nathan-Elena relationship. So that's Uncharted Drake's fortune, but there are a few things I want to talk about at large. This game is beautiful. In many ways, it was set up to be an early showcase of the PS3's abilities, and this game not only looks amazing, even today, but plays so smoothly and the animation is just incredible. This is one of the first times in video games as a whole with the cutscenes where people act and behave like real people, and the voice cast does a wonderful job. I don't think there are any sour performances, at least. Story-wise, well, it's an Indiana Jones-esque adventure romp. It's fun, lighthearted, over-the-top, and full of cool action moments. It isn't Shakespeare, but you can really get lost in how the characters act and speak, and they are really likable characters even if they constantly banter while getting shot at. You may have noticed that I applaud the game's willingness to not take itself too seriously, but still point out dumb things like the origins of exploding barrels. It's an action movie, why should we care? And sure, I get that, but I disagree. There's a happy medium of believability and action set piece that can occur, and I don't think this balance was achieved in this game very well. After all, we all yell at the screen when horror movies' characters split up. It's because we get invested, and so we notice when things happen that break our ideas of how normal humans would act or behave. Remember the chase through the jungle? It can be a fun moment, a memorable set piece, but I think the same could have happened and my suspension of disbelief maintained if there were just less vehicles and you had a less powerful gun. Let's talk about linearity. This game is as linear as it gets, and there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but it's how it's executed where the seams show. Naughty Dog liked to force the player into doing something their way, or no way. You can only jump handhold to handhold, only hold on to certain ropes and chains, not others, and the way they create set-piece moments is to break the rules of the game, and it's something I'm okay with only in some cases. I don't mind that they give you infinite ammo sometimes or small stuff like that, but when they start instant killing you if you try something that they don't want you to do, no matter how logical it might be, that annoys me, and it's all over this game, made worse by the fact that Nate ragdolls every time you do something the game didn't think of. At times, you can feel like you have someone breathing over your shoulder, pressing reset every time you did something off the beaten path. This also applies to how Naughty Dog seemingly place enemies all over levels without much regard for why they are there. Overall, I'm not a big fan of Uncharted Drake's Fortune. When I played it initially, I downright hated it, and over time I forgot why. Revisiting it, I remember, a lot of design decisions feel antiquated, especially jarring in a game with so much beauty and attention to detail. Invisible walls, infinite spawns, instant deaths, and killer waters seem like elements we left behind long ago, and it can be frustrating to deal with them while trying to enjoy this game. Now, having played it on an easier difficulty, I enjoyed it a fair amount more. It's still pretty mediocre though. It's a great framework for a game, and I'm very happy it spawned a fantastic series which I will be discussing in upcoming videos, but standalone, I'm not sure it holds up. If you like the combat and how limited it is, you can find a good time here. The game is worth playing through on easier difficulties just for the story and to see how the series began, but the frustration amps up on hard just due to the one-shot kills. In the end, Uncharted Drake's fortune stumbles a lot, but at least it's a good foundation for the next games to come. In the next episode of Backwards Compatible, I'll be talking about Uncharted 2 Among Thieves, a game which many consider to be leaps and bounds improved over this game. Backwards Compatible is a video series looking back at older games in long form, one of many kinds of videos I hope to do on my channel. If you enjoy it, I hope you'll like, subscribe, follow me on Twitter at Mishakos, and support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash Thanks everyone and have a wonderful day.